Hi everyone, my name is Jacob, and welcome to the Free Thought Forum, presented by the Pennsylvania Nonbelievers. Uh, joining me tonight again is Doug. Hi, uh, Doug. Greetings. And we've got quite a bit to talk about tonight. There's a lot, been a lot happening since our last episode, uh, but our, our top story we really wanted to talk about uh, in great detail is that of Brittany Maynard, which I'll turn it over to Doug to give you the details about that. Okay. Uh, first, fellow veterans uh, out there, uh, welcome. Thank you for tuning uh, in, and also, thanks for your service. Um, to be or not to be, you know, that was the question for Brittany Maynard. Now, Brittany Maynard worked as a volunteer advocate for the nation's leading end-of-life uh, choice organization, Compassion and Choices. And she moved to Portland, Oregon with her husband, uh, Dan Diaz, and mother, uh, Debbie Ziegler. Now, Brittany was only 29 years old and a newlywed of one year when she was diagnosed with brain cancer the first of this year, some New Year's Day present, you know. Uh, she had surgery, but by April, the tumor had returned and her prognosis was bleak. She was told that she had about six months left. Well, uh, Brittany quickly wrote up a bucket list for herself, uh, and her and her husband uh, of one year decided to cram a lot of living into the months that she had left. Um, Maynard, 29, had geoblastoma, a fast-moving malignancy that, according to the National Brain Tumor uh, Society, is the most deadly, most prevalent form, and it's also nicknamed the Terminator. So Brittany answered her own question and ended her own life by physician-assisted suicide November 1st of this year, all legal, legal uh, under uh, Oregon's um, <coughs> oh, um, yeah, what, it, what do you think it's uh, it's it's taken it's been getting a lot of support from a lot of different people mm -hmm. and I think I think especially from anyone who's watched anyone die of cancer it's uh, it's really is one of the worst ways to die. It, it really is. It's a slow, really a slow or not so slow wasting away of your own body, uh, especially with what she had, where not only was it, it going to kill her, but she was already experiencing, it started with, you know, terrible migraine-like headaches, which escalated into strokes that were getting more frequent and longer. Well, I'm sorry, uh, seizures that were getting more frequent and longer, which actually has been escalating into something that was reminiscent of a stroke. Uh, so it's, it really is a, a painful, long, agonizing way to die. So I think there's been a lot of people, and th there's, there was really no hope for her either. It's, she, was, she was definitely going to die in a couple of months. And she actually looked into a lot of the different treatment options, and none of them were too promising. I mean, there was one that could have extended her life by a couple of months but would have probably given her brain damage. Yeah. So, I mean, there was really no good choices. Why don't you throw up that picture of the, uh, the brain scan there, show just how much of her brain was yeah. there. You see, look at it. I mean, that, that's over a quarter of her brain uh, there, and see how it sort of, it actually even indents uh, the, uh, the, the center line of the, uh, the brain. Yeah. yeah. It's, and, it's, and it's the kind of thing, it's, Sometimes people don't want, just don't want to talk about physician-assisted suicide, but it's like this case of a young woman who had a, an extremely legitimate reason to has kind of pushed it forward and, and, and make people talk about it again, make us think that, you know, this is, it, it's, you know, think, show exactly why people want this. It's not out of some selfish reason. There are legitimate reasons and, you know, Watching someone someone die of cancer can literally destroy a family, you know, because yeah. it's 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 not just difficult for the person going through it, but their their family who has to watch this happen uh, can be it can can really rip a family apart. Mm -hmm. My brother um, had uh, has colon cancer, um, 
he should be dead by now, like that, but um, he's been hanging on in a lot of uh, pain. So, uh, also... Uh, and well, and that, that's the thing I should point out. It's, this was her, her decision and her alone, hers alone. Yeah. And it, it's, it's, it's really about, for, for when we, I, I should say, when we support things like, well, at least I should say, speak for me personally, or people who support things like the Right to Die movement, it's not about saying that everybody should do this. No. It's you should have that choice. Mm -hmm. if, if, you, if you don't want to keep fighting, that's your choice. Now, some people fight and hang on for a few more years. That's great. But that's not going to be the case every time. No. And, and you shouldn't force it onto everybody to, to have to do that. Uh, I mean, uh, if uh, you have uh, got free will, then this is one of the things that you should have, uh, you know, you, free will to end it if you, uh, if you want to. Especially with this, with this type of cancer, there's, there's really no hanging on. No. Yeah. Well, I mean, you, you want a certain quality of life, just uh, right. uh, hanging on to the last possible second. Oh, that, that to me is right. that's horrendous. Yeah, I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to force anyone through it personally. So, well, you know, her actions have stirred up a lot of religious debate about this contentious subject. You know, of course, religious people have condemned suicide and deemed to be the death at the whim of, uh, of some god. So, um, <sighs> What can I say? It, you know, if man has free will, then he should have the freedom to end his own life when faced with such a bleak and painful lingering. And that's the terrible yeah. part about it. It's the lingering uh, yeah, death. Right. I mean, it's... And I, I think the, the, the more offensive comments I've seen on it have suggested that she's in hell for it. And I, I think that's that's terrible. I mean... The, that's just, you know, your family's just lost a loved one, and then you have someone telling, telling you she may be in hell now because she didn't want to go through the suffering. Well, it's like those uh, people at the Westboro Baptist Church, yeah. those sadists that w want to go to uh, military funerals right. uh, with their uh, you know, nasty signs, their fallacious signs. Uh, they are saying that, you know, that they're... Their sons uh, are, and family are in hell uh, yeah. too. And it's one of those things where, where religion can circumvent rational thinking. Where it's, we look at it as you know what's you know how to ease suffering and you know what you know not putting people through the situation <laughs> where the religious organization says well it's it's the will of god for have this to have this brain tumor never mind how horrible a statement that is to begin with mm -hmm. um and then to say she has to go that god wills someone to go through that that amount of suffering yeah and and when <laughs> as people say you know compared to that you know compared to the suffering she had ahead of her you can literally say, compared to that, Jesus only had a bad weekend for our sins. <laughs> yeah, that's that's what it, that's what it comes down to. Is it, it's it's hard to, j j I mean, looking at the raw amount of suffering. But um, <clears throat> what was the other thing I was going to say? It was, uh, and and this isn't this isn't the first for a church to oppose something like this in terms of of medical procedures, because at first you know. Churches were against vaccines. They actually some still are, because they believe you'll you'll only get diseases mm -hmm. if it's the will of God. So don't interfere with the will of God. Mm -hmm. They've also in the past protested life insurance, uh, protested you know any number of things, you know protested medicines, any number of yeah. things to do Oper with operating on people. Oh no no you 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 should not uh, cut into a. Uh uh, a person uh, right. uh, when they're alive and uh, even still when they're dead um, right even though that's greatly improved medical you know, our medical yeah. technology to help people who are still alive and and that's what and, and that's why you know 
that's why we, we push for a secular society because it's just the, this is what you get when you let religion rule is they would they would impose some things like this like outlawing physician assisted suicide to make you go through the the long drawn out suffering that comes with it, with dying of cancer yeah well they uh, they said that um, Mother Teresa uh, used to uh, withhold pain medication from right. some of their yeah. patients because yeah. he wa she wanted them to know the suffering that Jesus went right. through. Right. She, she, she did say that suffering brought people, her, her, her main philosophy was that suffering brought you closer to God. Yeah. Which is... It's not a God I want to know. No, I, I, I can't believe how, how people don't see what an awful statement that is and how that contradicts the whole idea of a loving God. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, I've seen a lot of, at least, especially from the secular community, <laughs> show support for her. Because at least, well, even if they don't support her decision, they at least support the, her right to make that decision. Yeah. And, and I think that's an important di distinguishment to make, is that there's a difference between supporting a decision and supporting someone's right to make that decision. Yeah. And the you know, same thing goes with the uh, abortion uh, uh, issue uh, there. Well, you know, if you think uh, ab abortion is wrong, don't have an abortion. Um, you know, but the, the women that got to carry um, this unwanted uh, uh, child, they're saying, oh, well, they don't, they, they shouldn't have any uh, choice uh, whatsoever. Well, I beg to differ. Right. But, it's another subject. Yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah. There's a lot, a lot, a lot, lot you could go into there. We could we could spend a couple of shows talking about things like that. But I, but that's uh, I guess all we have to say about that. Do you have any other things to say on the subject before no, we move no, on? No, uh, yeah, it's, no. it's 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 a it's a really sad, tragic incident. But I think it's, I, I think it's good. Her objective to make people at least start talking about it again has been successful. Yeah. Um, but moving on to the next uh, uh, topic, today is Veterans Day, da -da -da. Yeah, where we celebrate uh, the, the veterans who have uh, served this country and served it well, and uh, have, have, we, all, we all owe them a debt of gratitude. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things we do as an atheist community is to uh, try to dispel the myth of that there are no atheists in foxholes. You know, and, and there's a lot of atheists in our military that do feel somewhat isolated because our, our, our military is very overtly religious. Uh, there's, you know, and there's been a lot of discrimination within the military uh, towards atheists, or at least pretty much pressuring people to stay closeted about it. They can't be, it's hard for anyone to be an open atheist in the, in the military, which yeah. is partly which is probably part of the reason why that nobody <laughs> thinks there is one in there. Mm -hmm. But that's where we'd like to talk about a man by the name of Jason Torpy, who heads the Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers. And we actually have a video for you where uh, he discusses his, uh, the organization and himself. Uh, if you could play that video. My name is Jason Torpy. I'm from Marriott, Ohio. I'm the president of the Military Association of Atheists and Freethinkers. I'm a humanist and I'm openly secular. I was born humanist and it just took about 20 years to figure it out. When I was 10 or 12, uh, I was going to Catholic church. That's how I was raised and it didn't seem to be working out. It didn't make sense to me so I asked to go across the street to the Presbyterians and down the road to the Lutherans and across the way to the Baptists and none of that made sense so I started studying other things Eastern religions and New Age stuff and and very quickly moved to the natural world science is a good way to understand the world and uh, caring about people more than scriptures or gods or, or mythology in the military there's there are reinforcing mechanisms that basically say if you're not part of the team if you're different at all then that's a bad thing you know when the military has turned their backs on people who have non-theistic and naturalistic beliefs uh, it calls into question the whole institution. It makes it very difficult for the military to be successful as a team when a, when a large portion of the team is excluded 
officially. Uh, the military chaplaincy is 98% Christian and 66% are from evangelistic denominations. This is on the militaryatheist.org website. There's some interpretation of the numbers there, but not that much. So two-thirds of the chaplaincy is even evangelistic in nature. They're out to be fishers of men. And, you know, it's a very concerning demographic, especially when less than 20% of the population self-identifies with those same denominations. In the United States, we have a, a long history of humanists working in hospital settings, hospice <coughs> settings, in the Veterans Administration. The Unitarian Universalists have openness to humanist values. And Buddhists, they don't have necessarily a, a personal God or a prayer ethos. And they all do excellent work as chaplains. And it's only the evangelistic Christians, those fundamentalist Christians that are anti-atheist and anti-humanist in nature, that, that float out this, this personal and biased uh, misrepresentation of what chaplains do and what chaplains are. Humanists, atheists, agnostics, whatever your personal label is, if you have a non-theistic and naturalistic belief system, if you want to be good without God, uh, the, best way, the best reason to be open about that is because there are so many other people that you can connect with. You're going to enjoy those relationships and that joy and uh, that enjoyment that you have to connect with others of like mind and to share those values with other people is going to be multiplied even more when you inspire others to come out of the closet as well to stand up and, and that's been my experience and that's other people's experience as well. They're open about their beliefs even in a small way in a conversation and they find that other people even if it's just on the side to start out with say oh I'm so happy that you spoke up you know those kinds of um, you know I, I want to express myself as well and it's really inspiring to see you speak up and and people come together very quickly when when people are are out and open about who they are and it's just liberating personally to do so And you can find uh, that video on the YouTube channel open, o called Openly Secular, uh, which I'll be linking the, the, the video, the, the link to the video in the description box when I put this uh, episode on YouTube. Uh, there's also a much longer clip we don't have time to bring you, but I'll also include the link to that as well. Great. And it's, it's, it's good to have people like him um, standing up for the atheist in the military. Uh, who really, really need that help. I, when I enlisted uh, in the Army, uh, actually in 1962, um, I, I can't remember the word I put down, but it put down, you know, uh, religion uh, on it, and I either put atheist or none uh, on it, and I got half the form filled out, and the, this sergeant came round and back, looked over my shoulder, and said, uh, you don't really want to put that down. I said, yo, put what down? Uh, he says, under religion. I said, well, what am I supposed to put down? And he says, well, what was your family? I was, I don't know. Uh, so what was your mother? I said, well, I guess she was Protestant. He says, that's what you are, a Protestant. Put that down. Yeah. And he yeah. says, you'll thank me later. Yeah, yeah it is. It is. Uh, pretty bad and actually some even some religious have expressed uh, expressed um, some support for the humanist chaplains because it gives them a, pl to, go, a place to go to <laughs> express some problems without you know some of the pressure and shame that comes with religion for having those problems. Yeah. Doug and Jacob. I'm sorry? When I went, when I went in the military uh, I ran into the same thing that Doug did. Um, at that time, there were a lot of COs, they were called, conscientious objectors. Oh, yeah. And they were given a real hard time, uh, not only from the sergeants, but any time we did anything vaguely militaristic, if that's where. Yeah. Uh, they just had to take their full packs and basically run for the whole time we were doing the class. And it was... I, is it's this done on purpose, really? Is your voice going out over the air? It should be. Um, okay, I, I hope so. Yeah, because that's one of the labels that they wanted to uh, uh, put on me. Is it? Are you a conscientious objector? Uh, you know, and uh, I, I, I knew better than to say 
uh, yes, no, no. Say, uh, not, you didn't want to be a CEO, no. uh, unless that was your, you know, firmly held belief, of course. But uh, right. you know, I was at that time. I was basically agnostic. Yeah, right. And I, I didn't care. I'm, you know, I <laughs> so I, I want to do like. Uh, that, that's what they call an apatheist. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Jump up and down. I want to kill. I want to kill. I want to have yeah. blood and veins and guts and my teeth. <laughs> right. But yeah, that's. And you know, I can tell you, um, even though I've never been in the military myself, uh, the church I went to growing up had pretty much. If you were going into the military, they brought you up on stage to parade you out that you were doing that. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, it, there's. That the religion and mili the m military and the religion and Christianity are so intertwined right now. It's as as you know, th as Jason just said. You know, it's and it's really not reflecting the demographics of this country very well with how it's being represented in the military. And I think, and I think it's it's something that definitely needs to change. But they've got a captive audience in the military. I right. mean, it's it's so tough to say no or that's BS. Uh, there, when you're in the military, you're taught to keep your mouth shut right. and follow orders and do what you're told and think what you are told to think. Right, and and the thing is, as he was also saying, it's, it you, there's there's a kind of an in group versus out group where if you're in the military, you have to have that you know, a bond of trust there, where. Many em em evangelists are very distrustful of atheists, so it's hard to establish those relationships right as it is right now because mm -hmm. of that. Um, you can't see it right now, but um, on the back of my uh, shirt, uh, there it's got a, a, a picture of uh, a, a cross, uh, Islam, Buddha, uh, and a couple of other religious things uh, on there. And it says, when all else fails, we have got your back, signed Atheists in Foxholes. Get up and show them, Doug. <clears throat> Stand up and show them. Okay, I'll stand up and show them. Take my thing off this evening. Uh -huh. Can you see it? Uh, you should be able to flip to a camera and zoom in on it. There you go. You can see it? Yeah, they can see it. Oh, yeah, yeah. I can see it on the other one. Yeah. Right. Okay. <laughs> okay. But That's this should be good. <clears throat> We did that for an atheist in Foxholes um, March pr um, presentation that we put, uh, that we, American atheists put uh, on in Washington, D.C. It was a big demonstration uh, for atheists in Foxholes, I guess, yeah. about 10 years ago. Yeah. And uh, uh, something I'd also like to say about uh, secular humanism <coughs> is uh, a district judge in Oregon actually recently ruled that secular humanism can be treated as a religion yeah. with the, for the purpose of the Establishment Clause. Now, this may seem weird at first to say that this is a good thing because no one really wants secular humanism to be declared a religion, but that's not what they're saying. They're saying it can be treated as one for the purposes of, of the, the Establishment Clause, meaning they're not, they're not declaring it a religion but in any place that religion has the right to, say, distribute pamphlets, pamphlets or whatever, that secular humanists have the right to do that, too, which mm -hmm. is, is a great thing. And it actually makes some sense if you start to think about it, because, because... Um, I think we blew up. Yeah. I wasn't expecting that, sorry. No, me either. Um, because really, if you think about it, let, like if you if you strip away the the supernatural beliefs of religion for a second, all one, one thing all religions do is they give you a set of principles and values that you're supposed to follow, and to some some sense, humanists do that too, where they have a set of a, a set of, of values that they that is what defines hum, what humanism is. Mm -hmm. So. In that respect, there's there's a lot of similarities. Now, of course, for humanism, it's more based the, the re, your reasoning is more based on you know reason and evidence rather than you know 
authorita- authoritative, uh, authoritative dogma, rather. So, in that sense, it's you know if if you have a if you have a Christian coming in telling you you, you should live your life this way, then it, it's equally fair to have you know a humanist saying no, we think these are the values you should have. And in that sense, is why why humanism should have the same sorts of rights as religions do. In that sense, I mean, just just in that sense. Now, I should point out this uh, this ruling actually had um, some precedents behind it, because there are several Eastern philosophies that are already treated this way under the Establishment Clause, where they're treated as a religion. They're not actually considered a religion. But for the purposes of the Establishment Clause, they're, they're considered a religion, not like a religion. The, the thing is, though, that um, y- you, you need uh, this sort of legislation uh, because of hate crimes. Right. There, uh, th- there are no uh, charges of, of, of a hate crime. You go and beat up. Uh, a secular humanist or uh, an uh, atheist uh, and burn his property or something, they can't turn around and say that's a, a hate crime. Are you, you sure know, that's about just that? Reserved, that's just reserved uh, for churches. Uh, yeah, I mean, they've got other, uh, you know, uh, charges. Well, well can, I realized, uh, but I thought it could be considered a hate crime because it, well, for the most part, religion, when the court rules something for religion, it mm-hmm. usually carries over to non-religion equally. Mm-hmm. Although, it, as uh, I, I heard someone say uh, in, a, in the speech recently, that the court, the Supreme Court, has been actually pretty inconsistent about how they've been applying, uh, how they've been applying the Establishment Clause, to the point it's gotten kind of confusing. Like I think it was last year they ruled on two Ten Commandments monuments at once, mm-hmm. and one they let stay up, and the other one they ordered taken down. And the reasoning were were bizarre. So it's, but um, well, you know, a, a law gets uh, struck down. Yeah. Uh, it it, uh, it changes. Now, you know, you can always appeal the the decisions, even in the you know the Supreme Court. Something happens, and then some other court comes along and uh, says, "Well, I got a slightly different opinion." Well, uh, uh, here and it's it, all, well, it depends. Arguing. Well, as I said, this is uh, the Oregon ruling was actually uh, just a district ruling. Uh, mm-hmm. Then it would go to a higher court and then to the Supreme Court, and depending on which court it's ruled in is where it has jurisdiction, and that's what it means. It's like the Oregon ruling actually doesn't apply to the United States. I'm mm-hmm. sorry, to it wouldn't apply in Pennsylvania because it's under a different jurisdiction. <clears throat> now, if it gets appealed all the way to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court appeals that, uh, upholds this, then, then that ruling has precedence over the entire United States is how that works. It, it just depends on which level of the court it goes to is how much uh, precedence it goes over. For example, uh, in the wake of Kiss Miller versus Dover, yeah. that decision only applied locally because the lawyers involved knew that they would be fools to go any higher with it. Because if they went higher with it, it was sure to be up. They were surely going to uphold the decision, and it would then the the uh, the precedence of that ruling would apply even further than it does now, which is you know. It can be, let's just say, it can it can be a bit of a headache trying to figure all this out. I can admit I, I can admit that. Presidents can be scary things. Uh, right. Yeah. Right. But um, so again, that's uh, the the organization he was for was the Military Association of Atheists and Free Thinkers. And on the uh, on the subject of some other of a few other uh, non-religious charities that are, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, that are uh, go- undergoing some major fundraisers right now that if you're interested in donating to is a good time for it. Uh, first, there is Recovering from Religion, uh, which is founded by Daryl Ray, actually, mm-hmm. who, and right now they're trying to meet a $15,000 goal to, uh, really get a lot of uh, different chapters going and currently all donations will be tripled uh, due to 
these some generous donors uh this is this is a really good time to donate your your money will be stretched even further are, are they 501 c3 i think they should be yeah i know they, they should were be. applying i don't know if they got uh, it i don't know yet. if they uh, yeah i don't know if they, for sure if they've got it yet but i i think they do uh but those donations will also be used to uh, support other related uh, charities related to recovering from religion, uh, such as the Secular Therapist Project. And uh, we've talked about them uh, a couple times before, so I'm, I'm not going to reiterate it here, but these are some, some great organizations for people who are coming out of religion and really need someone to talk to about it, basically. And we'll have uh, trained counselors um, including, uh, th they have a lot of trained counselors and uh, and phone banks to help people get through any personal crises they might be going through. I imagine it's got to be uh, a lot like qu quitting smoking. Um, yeah. I, I mean, I I smoked for many uh, years and I just gave it up like that. But even a, you know, a year or two uh, afterwards, I would actually unconsciously reach for uh, you know, a pack of cigarettes yeah. Yeah, in, in my pocket. I'm like, Wait a minute, I don't do that uh, anymore, you know? Yeah. Uh, but my hand still reached in my pocket uh, for a cigarette. And I wonder how many people uh, uh, reach in their pocket for religion. Yeah. You know, the same sort of a thing, like, oh, yeah. just a quick fallback, just a, a quick puff on religion. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's 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 definitely a difficult process, but um, uh, the other major fundraiser coming up is for uh, Foundation Beyond Belief, which uh, w which on December sixth, uh, the podcast Dogma Debate uh, will be holding a twenty four hour drive for uh, to to benefit Foundation Beyond <laughs> Belief. Uh, again, that's on December sixth, and if you want more information about that. Uh, you can go to Dogma Debate's website, which is uh, simply dogmadebate.com, which is actually, I, I, I don't think we've really mentioned it much, that podcast much on this show, but it is actually one of the more popular podcasts, uh, atheist podcasts. Uh, of course, uh, no one really beats Seth Andrews' podcast, but you can come close. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> so if, you, if you're interested in... Uh, uh, if you're interested in uh, donating to some secular charities, uh, these are some uh, some great ones to donate to, and uh, this is a good time during in the middle of their drives. Very good. But um, now we're from again. Religion. That's recovering from religion, secular therapist project, uh, as well as Foundation Beyond Belief. <coughs> now, uh, next, I'd like to talk about uh, now that we're in the month of December. It's a special time for atheists, isn't it? Yeah. It's that yeah. time of year we were all joined together to stamp out the horrible thing known as Christmas. Yes. Oh, yes. Just we, march down to, the street. Yes. Today, where we our annual war on Christmas is already underway, and I have a good feeling maybe, just maybe this year, we'll finally bring it down. I'll put on my religion stomping boots and go out and... Down yeah. Main Street and it, in all the malls and yeah, everything. Yeah. yeah, it's it's not just nativity scenes. It's also Santa Claus. Let's yep. just get rid of it all. Get, get rid of it. Oh, and <laughs> and if you want to um, if you want to get, catch up on all that is going on, check out the blog. It's called at waroverchristmas. I'm sorry, waroverxmas. dot com, and there you can see. <clears throat> We, there, we actually have access to uh, people writing, uh, writing letters about this from both sides of the war, even Christians who are, are bent on defending something that's not worth defending anymore. And, of course, we, we all have to thank our Supreme Commander-in-Chief, David Silverman, who will, <laughs> taking, the fight, uh. taking the fight to the enemy generals such as Bill O'Reilly, as you can see there, yeah. yeah. I mean, come on. But I, I guess, uh, you know, but no matter what, I'm sure uh, Silverman will, will definitely keep, keep taking the fight to O'Reilly, even though I'm sure Silverman is 
his, uh, his face is going to stick in the meme face for at one point or another. <laughs> but I, I wonder, you know, if, if how many people have really had taken a poke at Bill O'Reilly? Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and, uh, you yeah, know, obviously they, they probably don't want to put it on the air uh, yeah. like that, but someone as obnoxious uh, yeah. as, as he is, for crying out loud, uh, he, he must have uh, well made a few as, people ivory. As, as David Silverman has sometimes said, actually we have Bill O'Reilly to thank for for the rise in atheism, because you find every year at Christmas time there's a spike in people searching for atheist things, mm -hmm. and it's probably because of Bill O'Reilly talking about the war on Christmas. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but seriously, I mean this is I. Uh, we obviously this is this is sarcastic satire, but it, it's it's fun it's fun to joke about that they've talked about it all the time. Like uh, there there was one year I actually had very shortly into November, one of my religious family members was already talking about the war on Christmas. So, and I I remember a a funny thing that that uh, it was last year on the Thinking Atheist podcast where they. Someone actually asked, uh, they were asking what, what the atheists were doing for Christmas. And they asked Aaron Ra, who was, a, who was actually into paganism at one point, you know, are you, they asked him, oh, are you going to put up any pagan symbols around your house? And the, everyone kind of laughed and go, wait a minute, everybody already does. <laughs> you know, I mean, the Christmas tree and the yeah, Christmas I'll, I'll call, and They're everything. all all from paganism, which is why we've got to bring them down. Yes. And <laughs> paganism. <laughs> But uh, again, the the blog waroverxmas.com is uh, is really a, a satirical look at the the whole the whole controversy, just really poking fun at it, like we are now. It's it's fun. It's it's definitely a lot of fun to joke about. Like I remember uh, it, for our Bedford debate, uh, Bedford protests, where the um, the district attorney accused the kid in question of being part of the anti-Christian war on Christmas. Fan school prayer, uh, opposed display of the Ten Commandments crowd, and we're sitting there going, "Hey, that's us you're talking about." <laughs> <laughs> is, is there something wrong with being part of that crowd? <laughs> but, but, uh, but yeah, it's, there's a bit of hyperbole uh, there because people tend to take it so uh, seriously, like, "Oh yes, that, that people are uh, you're know, openly trying to." Uh, get rid of Christmas? Right. Why? I mean, it's not worth our time or our effort. It yeah. is, however, worth our time uh, and effort uh, if uh, you go in the public square and uh, you only want to uh, promote Christianity like that and you, you don't want to promote uh, anything uh, else like that, you know, there's more than one uh, right. religion, and uh, it it should include everyone. Right, right. It just it's just a it's, a, it's an attempt to be more inclusive and be not not push religion. But of course, it, it's hard to get away from that. You know, I made the joke. Uh, some I think somebody there was some school had a, a rules about how many evangelical Christmas carol, carols they could sing. Uh, during a performance. Oh, that was last year. Wasn't yeah, it was yeah. last year, and yeah. I and I made the comment like, okay, um, I guess nobody could go to find a church that was singing Christmas carols at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, that's 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 what that's really what the old old point is about. It's not we don't care what people do on their free time. Just yeah. don't use the public time for it. It's like you know um, the opening prayers in Congress and right. uh, and everything. <laughs> Who are you kidding? I mean, they're just putting on display. Yeah. Uh, right. But uh, yeah, it looks like we're winding down, starting to wind down here a little bit. But oh, we got we've about got, twenty got, minutes left. Yeah, we've got enough time. Um, <clears throat> the last few weeks, I've been uh, trying to keep a uh, a brief segment on philosophical concepts going. And I've got a little piece today. It shouldn't, won't be much, but what I wanted to kind of talk about were uh, some logical fallacies. And what, what those are are just 
uh, in, you know, problems, errors in thinking, you know, uh, arguments, you know, arguments made that are are invalid, and and I think it's it's important to to recognize these, and I and I think I, I heard a debater once say, even if you can't spot them in yourself when you're using, if you're using them, try to spot them in others, and that'll help you try to spot them in yourself, you know, just to make sure you're not you're not using an argument that you really shouldn't be using. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I was going to, I was talking, I was looking at mostly there's, there's actually hundreds of them. There's actually entire books written just list, listing fallacies, but I picked a few that are actually, uh, fairly commonly used by apologists that I've noticed. Uh, the first one I've looked at is called special pleading. And I, one thing I should say about fallacies is the interesting part about them is Many of them actually have, can be like legitimate if used correctly, but they're called fallacies because they're quite often used incorrectly. Uh, for example, special pleading. This is when you make a special case for something, like maybe say it doesn't, like the criteria you use to dismiss everything else doesn't apply, this, that criteria doesn't apply to this thing. Now that can be legitimate. You can make a case why that criteria doesn't apply. But a lot of times you'll see, they'll say, well, it doesn't apply just because, and don't give a good reason for it. Mm -hmm. So if you, if you exclude something, if you make a special case for something, you have to be able to substantiate that special case. Uh, for example, they, you know, you'll often see this in the cosmological argument. They said, well, you know, anything that exists, you know, you know, how did the universe come to exist by itself? And we said, well, how does God come to exist by itself? That's special pleading, because there's there's no way you can you can really define a God that that wouldn't apply to. Um, another thing you have is well, one thing I should say there's there's both things called uh, formal and informal fallacies, and formal ones are like the, the the bare bones basic ones like special pleading where informal ones are sometimes a collection of fallacies that are often committed at the same time. And I'll get into some of those as well. Uh, for example, a formal fallacy would be like uh, uh, circular reasoning, where you, you start to argue in a circle, like when people use the Bible to prove the Bible. Mm -hmm. Or I actually saw William Lane Craig do this once, where in, in one of his books actually, was he used the Bible to prove the miracles of Jesus, the miracles of Jesus to prove the divinity of Jesus, and then the divinity of Jesus to prove the authority of the Bible, which is a, 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 to see a professional philosopher making this kind of essay. What? Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, but the, uh, to see a professional philosopher commit an obviously fallacious argument mm -hmm. is part of the reason that a lot of people have a hard time taking philosophy seriously sometimes, mm -hmm. or especially uh, Christian apologists for that matter. But an informal variation of a, uh, mm -hmm. of a circular argument is what's known as begging the question. And that's when you I beg your pardon? Begging oh. the question. Oh, oh okay. Set up. But uh, what begging the question is, is essentially where you try to hide a conclusion in the premise. Uh, one example of that would be like a Christian telling you, well, Christianity must be true because it's the only thing that can explain why we live in a fallen world. But first you have to explain why we live in a fallen world. You know, you have to prove that's a conclusion you've reached, what, that's part of your premise. So that's what they mean by begging the question is you're, you're including a premise in the, the uh, well, you're including a conclusion in the premise of the argument. Uh, another thing you'll see a lot is what's no, are false dichotomies. Well, they'll say, well, it's either, a lot of times you'll show you people, apologists just arguing against atheists and just ignoring every other religion. Like it's, it's only, you know, Christianity or their version of Christianity or, or atheism, nothing else in between. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've even seen apologists refer to Muslims as atheists. Because and vice versa. And what? And vice versa, too. Oh, that's yeah. true. That's true. I mean, yeah. 
we're everyone is an atheist to someone else right. uh, you know yeah like Richard Dawkins says everyone's an atheist about something yeah we just go one further uh, another thing you'll see a lot is uh, what's known as a poisoning the well fallacy. That's where you try to associate your enemy with some, your opponent with something evil, or you know something that you assume people don't like. You know, you'll see this. You know, the Hitler argument is the classic example of that. Saying, "Well, Hitler was an atheist." Well, first of all, no, he wasn't. No. And secondly, well, he was also a dog owner and a vegetarian. Do we want to go after <laughs> dog owner and vegetarians now? <laughs> yeah, no, just just pit bull owners. Yeah. Of, uh, no, I don't think it was a. Pit, he didn't own a pit bull. No, I. I but we, you know, we have got to stretch that out, and right. we could turn it into saying uh, now uh, all, all pit bull uh, right. owners. You know. But uh, another another one you'll see. I've actually seen quite a bit of, a, a lot more recently, especially among liberal Christians. Well, actually, not just liberal Christians, but a lot of Christians is. Uh, all over the spectrum is what's known as uh, the no true Scotsman fallacy, which is an informal fallacy that was actually developed by, was formalized by Anthony Flew. And what it basically is, is when you try to come up with a rationalization to say why someone shouldn't be included in the same category as you. And why they say, and the example was, well, you did something like, the, like no no Scotsman would have done that, and then you find out a Scotsman did that, and they said, well, no true Scotsman did that, even though what happened has nothing to do with nationality. I've, I hadn't heard that before. Oh, you haven't? No, okay. no. It's, it's it's actually quite a common one. It's a very very common, because essentially I'm it's, uncommon, so that's maybe why. Okay, but it's actually it's I, I've seen it used quite a bit, especially recently, where they'll say. You know, no, you'll, you'll see this in a lot of Christianity saying, well, you know, if we bring up, say, the Inquisitions or the witch hunts, uh, they'll say, well, no, they didn't understand Christianity. They weren't true Christians, even though mm -hmm. the Bible point blank approves both of those things. Like, there's, there's no ambiguity, ambiguity either. You can point to a verse and say, yes, it does actually, um, actually uh, approve of those things. But what they want to do is try to separate themselves from the bad stuff of Christianity and only take in, you know, you know, the better, the better parts. And actually, I heard Dan Barker talking in a speech recently where he, he went through, he was debating, I forget who he was debating, but the guy actually used this so much that he, he actually declared that neither Martin Luther nor John Calvin were true Christians. Now I want you to think mm -hmm. about that for a second. You know, yeah, you know, the, the, some of the two biggest thinkers in in Christian Christian history, he said, no, they're not true Christians because they did something bad. And uh, I was like, it's 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 a common one you see. And in fact, I heard one person say, it's we might as well call it the no cr true Christian fallacy because it's actually used that much. But uh, another. Another one is, uh, you'll hear this a lot when they talk about prophecies, is what's known as the Texas Sharpshooter Fallacy. I think it's one of the more interesting names for a fallacy, but the whole idea of it is, imagine you shoot a bunch of bullets at a, tar at a board, and then you go to the biggest cluster of bullets and draw a bullseye around it. That's the idea, where you look at some of these prophecies, and they could mean pretty much anything from any time in history. Yeah. But with the time you're living in them, they're saying, oh, it's fulfilled all these, so therefore it must be filled. Like, let's draw the bullseye around that. And I've actually seen uh, this sort of thing in, in creationism a lot, too, where they'll try to just highlight the things that maybe the Bible could be interpreted to be getting right and ignore everything else is, is the whole idea of that. Um, another thing you'll hear quite common is uh, is what's known as an argument from incredulity, and that is essentially saying I don't understand it, therefore it must not be true. Oh yeah, yeah, I use that a lot. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the, the, the the thing about it is, is sometimes we really use that rhetorically. Yeah. Yeah, we we use that as a rhetorical device to say we do understand it, but we say how mm. could, I don't under, what you're really saying is I don't understand how anyone could, could think that's the case. Yeah. 
So sometimes it's better to clarify your language and say what you really mean. And actually, I would encourage anyone to do that. Don't try to let, I, I found I do better in conversations when I lay off the rhetorical devices and just say what I actually mean. Is, is, but I've actually people seen people actually use you know, blatant arguments from incredulity to try to prove a point. Like actually, some apologists will say, you know, there's no way, I don't understand how Christianity could have arisen if this stuff didn't really happen. Meanwhile, mm -hmm. Islam and Mormonism and practically other religions the other religion did the same thing. The yeah, same did the way. exact same thing, and they're like, um, and on a on a similar note, there's what's known as uh, an argument from ignorance, which is where you don't even attempt to find out the counter argument, mm -hmm. and you say there's no argument against it. Therefore, you know my position is true, even though there are plenty of arguments against it. Do you want me to uh, do the? Uh, just I'll get to that in a minute. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm almost finished with this point, but um, if you uh, another thing you often hear is an appeal to consequence, and sometimes these can be legit. The, now this isn't this is not a fallacy. Well, I should say. Hold on, let me back up a second. This is a fallacy because uh, it's appealing to. It's basically making a big deal out of the consequences. It's pretty much saying something like. If atheism is true, is true, then this would be true, and we wouldn't want that to be true now, would we? Now, mm -hmm. but whether or not you know, who do they include in we? Yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it's kind of like well, then it's like whether or not that is true, that doesn't have anything to do with whether or not the proposition is true. You just don't like saying if atheism is true, there would be no internal life. But that has nothing to do with whether or not it's true. You know, just because you don't like the, the, the consequences of the truth doesn't mean it's not true. Oh, I can't begin to tell you the number of times where I've heard people say that. Yeah. Uh, you know, uh, well, you wouldn't want that, would you? Shaking yeah. your head and, you know, you, you stand there and you go, well, no, no, of course not. Well, yeah. right. Then you think about it and you think, no. Yeah, it... it, it it's one of those things they appeal to consequences that have, that have no really. Well, then you might also get really fallacious appeals to consequence where they make up consequences. Like, you know, if atheist words were true, we're, we just go around like, you know, killing, ki kill, killing everybody. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that, and of course, there's, and I'm, I'm reading through the book, Christianity is Not Great, which pretty much debunks that entire idea. <laughs> Yes, we haven't raped and pillaged a village in right. years. Right. right. But uh, on a similar note, you also have a thing known as an appeal to emotion, which is, is a very similar fallacy. But uh, I've he heard people say that I actually saw a video once. And at first, I thought the video was fake. But, uh, but apparently, it's real, where somebody said, who, who was, a, was supposed to be an atheist, who had who just had a baby, and they said, you know, if it said something like, if my atheism were true, then this kid I hold in my arms is nothing but a collection of molecules. And I'm mm -hmm. like, really, you you converted to Christianity because of that? Yeah, but yeah. it's it's trying to to get to strike an emotional vein, even though that has nothing to do with whether or not the proposition is true. And uh, one more here, uh, I'd like to talk about that you'll, you'll see quite a bit is the equivitation fallacy. And that's where you try to pick, say, two things have, some, have something, well, two, two things might have, well, two things might have, say, three or four things in common with each other, but, but nothing else is in common with each other. They'll say just because of those couple things they have in common, they must be exactly equal which isn't the case. And you'll see this a lot with people trying to say that, well, because atheism's, atheists don't know for sure whether or not there is a God, they have faith, and which is the exact same as Christian faith, when, no, it's not the same. Even if you want to say it's not hard. You know, there are, you know, my personal take on it is there are varying degrees of faith, and it's important to see, important to know that, you know, just but, like there are varying degrees of certainty. And belief. Right, and belief, yeah. and, you know, but I think it's, you know, you have very, you know, you sometimes you're a little sure of something, very sure, 
or just a little sure, maybe somewhere in bet in between. You know, it's not the same thing. And then when, you know, uh, and equivocations are usually built out of false dichotomies, saying it's either all the way one way or all the way the other, mm -hmm. and you're either one or the other. So if you're just even a little bit this way, you must be equal to its extreme. But um, I'm going to turn it over to Doug for now to, uh, to go commence with our meeting reminders. Okay, these are our uh, upcoming uh, <laughs> meetings of uh, Pennsylvania non-believers. Our next York meeting will be December the 6th uh, at 10 a.m., uh, our Harrisburg uh, next meeting will be this month, uh, November the 13th at 7 p.m. Lebanon, November the 12th at 7 p.m. Chambersburg, and November the 18th at 7 p.m. And in good old downtown Lancaster, PA, November the 26th at 6.30 p.m. That's at uh, Isaac's uh, Restaurant. And I can't remember the name of the street that it's on now. <laughs> but but um, and you, I also point out here, I had to cancel the Perry County meetup for a couple of a bunch of reasons. I won't be able to run it. Uh, for the rest of this year, but I will be resuming it next year, uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, if you if you have uh, a preferred time to do it, I can use this time to maybe adjust the schedule of it. And um, as a reminder, I will be putting this episode on YouTube here shortly. It's not and I also yet. like to say on that point, uh, we're currently publishing the YouTube the videos of this year's PA State Atheist and Humanist Conference we had uh, over Labor Day weekend in Pittsburgh. So you want to check out our YouTube, YouTube page. Uh, also visit our website for any other information at panonbelievers.org. Um, I think that's about it. Um, oh, by the way, the, the, when I say Harrisburg meeting, actually it's Le Moyne. Le Moyne, um, yeah. Uh, so many cities there that just kind yeah. of blend into each other. You, might, you, know, you got Marysville right there. You got a lot of other things. But um, we're winding down now. So, um, again, uh, thank you for. Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you have anything else you wanted to say. No, I think that we've um, pretty much covered most of what the heck we. Uh, but, we're going to talk about. We uh, could, do you have uh, a subject for next week picked out yet? Yeah, next two weeks, or well, two weeks from now, I should say. Oh gosh, no! I'm sorry. I yeah. uh, I fell asleep on that. I was even l late uh, on this. Right. But um, yes, I'm sure that uh, something will come up. There's, yeah, it's uh, it's been a, well, like I said before, I didn't have much uh, for for this show, and then all of a sudden, these all these things started <laughs> happening at once, like court decisions, you know. You never know when you know, the court decision comes down and we end up spending the whole time talking about it. Yeah, and then I came down with some kidney stones, got to go in and get uh, ultrasound, break up a, a, a kidney stone. So that's it. anyone that's had kidney stones knows how pleasant uh, that is. Too um, much information, too much information. Yeah. <laughs> but, oh, um, so. yeah, but uh, in, the, in the coming weeks, though, I hope to... I get a book review out of a, a brand new book by John Loftus called Christianity is Not Great. Um, my, I, have, I was hoping to have it for this, this episode, but unfortunately it's a very long book. But uh, we'll see you next time. Uh, thank you for tuning in.